There we go. Okay. Is that better? All right. I see a hand, Elijah. Yes, give him a round of applause. First event of the year was here. We had Lynn Jackson, the great, great granddaughter of Harriet and Dred Scott. Um, in our troubled times, reconciliation was a very important um, attribute, one that's in short supply today. Many of you will have been here for that event. Now, between now and then, we've uh, put on 60 events at the Kinder Institute. We've sent more than 100 students on off-campus programs in Washington, D.C., in K. Professor Aaron earned an undergraduate degree from Amherst and an MA and PhD in history from the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Aaron is the author of more articles, review essays, and book chapters than I can count. He is also the author of a number of path-breaking books, including The American West, A Very Short Introduction, How the West Was Lost, the Transformation of Kentucky from Daniel Boone to Henry Clay, and my personal favorite, American Confluence, the Missouri frontier from borderland to border state. He is also the author of the ambitiously titled Worlds Apart, A History of the World, from the beginning of humankind to the present. I mean, what else could you want to know? <laughs> Professor Aaron's most recent book is titled Peace and Friendship. An Alternative History of the American West, published last year by Oxford University Press. Distinguished Professor of History Emeritus of the University of New Mexico, Virginia Scharf, has described this book as an exploration of, quote, historical interludes of accommodation, convergence, and harmony among people at odds. I think it's a good summary. Professor Aaron's presentation this evening focuses on a central theme of that book. Please welcome Professor Stephen Aaron for his lecture, Peace and Friendship, Lessons from the Legacy of Broken Concord.
Thank you so much. I know I'm not in Los Angeles because in Los Angeles, no program has ever started on time. In fact, um, if, a, if a program starts within 15 minutes of its scheduled start time, that's already unheard of, in part because people are certainly still stuck in traffic, um, and you just have to count on that. So the idea, this is quite a revelation to me, that when you said, well, we're going to start at 5.30, I assumed that meant 5.45. Um, so um, anyway, it's a pleasure to be here, and I am so grateful that so many of you turned out on this Southern California-like day um, to join me on a Friday afternoon uh, to talk about my most recent book um, and some larger themes that I think um, Jay sort of and Gary both talked about a little bit in their introductions uh, about this. I think it's, it's appropriate in that sense that my talk really is a bookend to the one that started this year. Because if the opening talk was about reconciliation, I think my talk, too, is about looking for possibilities of conciliation and reconciliation in the past and the lessons that we might plumb from that. Uh, as Gary mentioned, the lecture is entitled um, Peace and Friendship, Lessons from the Legacy of Broken Concord. Its first part derives from the title of my recently published book, Peace and Friendship, an Alternative History of the American West. And that post-colon uh, segment reflects my interest in exploring the lessons we might take away from what I call, and I'll talk more about this, what I call an alternative history of the American West. Um, the book, is still down, is about individuals and people on the American frontier who overcame past enmities to chart a fractured, tenuous, ultimately toppled path towards amity. And this evening, this afternoon, I want to speak about that and about a few of the lessons we might take away from the opened, if broken, Concord, and to highlight Missouri's centrality to this alternative history of the American frontier. Um, now, I should say, and Gary mentioned in his in introduction, in many ways, this book, um, is a sort of counterpoint to the book that I published a couple years ago, which is part of the Oxford Very Short Introduction series, um, which is it's a wonderful series, actually. Um, and I'm not just plugging my own book on this one. I am plugging my own book. Um, uh, and you see it sold in airport bookstores often, for example, because the, the, the genius of the series is really on hosts of subject to get in 35,000 words, and they really are strict about that 35,000 word limit, to get in 35,000 words something that you can sort of digest, I think on an airplane. So it's 35,000 words at 35,000 feet, um, I often thought, uh, and come away on the other side of your flight um, sort of with a, at least a cocktail party knowledge of, of any number of subjects. Now, I have to say, though, that and this actually gets back to the, to the subject of public history. One of the things you first learn as a public historian, or as anyone who, who sort of seeks to, to work in the public realm, is brevity, which I've shown none of so far, is a, is a really crucial skill. You know, you really have to get your message down to uh, tightly. So in a sense, it was an assignment that it was, I was eager to take on. But I have to confess that the first draft of the book came in at 70,000 words. So I went back to my editor at Oxford, who also, as I say, is this, this series, and there are hundreds and hundreds of titles in this series, and I said, look, my American West is, is particularly broad, because I'm not just doing the American West as you know it today. I'm doing, you know, the, all of North America is fitting into this, and I'm starting in pre-colonial, pre-Columbian times, and I'm going all the way to the present. So surely you can give me a few more words. And after all, for example, <laughs> this title, there must be some leftover words <laughs> from nothing. Um, and she looked at me and said, mm, and she pointed me to this title in the series. <laughs> and I guess I had to sort of go with the idea that if you can get the meaning of life in 35,000 words, then surely I can do the American West uh, in the same. So. I did get it down to 35,000 words, and, and I like to think of it as what I would call a mainstream, I mean my own interpretation of, but a mainstream history 
of the American West that really tried to distill and synthesize a generation of recent scholarship for that purpose. Um, the title of the new book, also from Oxford, comes from the inscription on peace medals like this one that emissaries of the United States gifted uh, on American Indian leaders. For nearly a century, um, from the founding of the Republic until after the Civil War, the presenting of these medals was a regular feature of the diplomacy between American officials and their Native American counterparts. Many typically featured on the other side, a bust of the reigning president on one side of the medal and on the other, some version of this peace and friendship inscription and then those clasping hands. Now, is going to come as a revelation to anyone. Neither peace nor friendship readily associate with either the mainstream history or the conventional mythology of the American frontier. What would histories of the westward expansion of the United States be without famous battles and infamous massacres? What would westerns be without their clashes of civilization and against savagery and their climactic gunfights. Now, even though in the last several decades, even as popular culture and scholarship about the American West and American frontier have shifted their view, have shifted their views significantly in recent decades, um, violence has retained its centrality uh, in both the history and the mythology of the American frontier. A chief difference, I would argue, between the older and newer Western histories is that which was once celebrated for manifesting America's destiny and making America great, again, uh, is now decried for enabling the expansion of the United States. Conquest, not concord, has become the watchword of Western American history. And in addition to conquest, the buzzwords that have animated frontier, borderland, and Western histories in the last generation have been empire, ethnic cleansing, settler colonialism, genocide, a sharp contrast with an older literature that tended to speak about westward expansion in terms of social progress, political democracy, economic development. But in common, in older and newer Western histories, violence, reigned. Across the history and historiography of the American West, there has not been much peace or friendship to be found in the annals of the Western American past. So when I told people that I had in mind to write a book about peace and friendship on the American frontier, they often responded that I must surely be writing another very short book. Now, if I had a copy, someone has a copy here to hold up as a prop. Someone hold it up. Who's got a copy? That's not that short a book. <laughs> Weighing in at about 110,000 words or so, Peace and Friendship is a fairly lengthy tome. Um, and I would argue, dark and bloody as the grounds of American frontiers often were, my book finds and focuses on sites and situations in which colonialism wore a different face, and in which relations between Indians, settlers, and states deviated for a time from the monolithic logic of elimination and exclusive occupation. The episodes that I chronicle provide evidence of individuals and people overcoming their differences, of barriers breached, of accords reached, and of erstwhile enemies finding common ground, of would-be combatants standing down, at least for a while. Traversing American frontiers from the Appalachians to the Pacific and from the birth of the United States through the first century as a republic, each chapter focuses on a particular locale in which foes faced off. Now, there's nothing alternative, obviously, about that. But in these cases, violence was contained. The book explores how amicable relations of varying degrees and durations developed unexpectedly at these sites and why these relations collapsed. This is an alternative history too often forgotten or misremembered, leaving it for my book to recover the legacy of Concord and plumb its lessons. 
Now, I guess uh, I should, before I go further, sort of say a little bit about some key terms. Um, because I think people get confused by my use of alternative history um, and where it fits in the scheme. Uh, if you Google the term alternative history, much to my dismay, it conflates it with alternate history. Um, and if you click on, on that link then, and if you've got your, your phone ready, you can go do it right now. Uh, if you click on alternate history, it takes you to, that, to a genre of, um, in which historical outcomes have been altered. Uh, the most numerous of these works in alternative, in alternate history, let's see if this audience can guess, the most numerous, uh, Civil War, the South winning the Civil War is number one, and number two, <laughs> what an educated alternate history audience I have here. Uh, yes, the Nazis winning the Second World War is the, is the other most common. Um, there are actually a number of titles, which I really, I won't recommend actually, that, that plumb various aspects of Western American history. My favorite was one in which Billy the Kid uh, survives and becomes a dentist in Colorado Springs. <laughs> Never mind. Um, I say that, but you know, actually even more so, um, sort of Quentin Tarantino's movies that strike me as the sort of, um, an epitome of this sort of genre of alternate history. Um, I guess my larger point, though, is that no one, I shouldn't say no one, no historian, would mistake these alternate histories for history. Um, most, alternate, most alternate histories have only a distant relationship to the historian's craft. Like a Quentin Tarantino film, alternate histories can elegantly, sometimes elegiacally, uh, evoke a once upon a time and place uh, but the alterations to what happened um, turn his films and scores of stim similar kinds of stories into fictions, science fictions, and fantasies. For few historians, including those who study the American frontier, give much credence to these alternate histories. In general, historians sometimes will raise alternate, alternate storylines, but we don't tend to follow those plot lines. Uh, for my part, to be clear, I am not interested in altering facts or, for that matter, in alternative facts. Although the search engine may conflate alternative and alternate histories, the two adjectives actually have distinct meanings. And for my purposes, the meaning of alternative that I latch on to is existing outside the mainstream. And in that sense, if the VSI, if that very short introduction was my mainstream history, this book is my alternative history, existing outside the mainstream. But I want to be clear, unlike in the genre of alternate history, the, the alternative history, in my book, the alternative history happened. Um, it does not require any what ifs or what might have beens to set the world in motion. To be sure and to be clear, the peace and friendship that happened on American frontiers was often unstable. Local arrangements that entailed or that, there, that curtailed violence gave way when balances of power and balances of powerlessness tipped. The interventions and arsenals of empires and nation states, though premised on enforcing law and creating order, often disturbed the peace, and devastated frontier-crossing friendships. Perhaps above all, the sites and situations featured in my book demonstrate the fragility of conciliations and reconciliations and show how susceptible this alternative history is to being forgotten or um, misremembered. Still, the episodes laced together to allow us to better understand when, where, and how people pushed aside their enmities, why these moments occurred yet did not endure, and what we might take away from the legacies of broken concord. Now the contrast, and those of you who know the literature of Western American history know that the book I'm playing off of the title of, the contrast between the legacies of concord and the legacies of conquest, Patricia Limerick's 
path-breaking synthesis of the new Western history, the legacies of conquest, might seem to set my alternative history entirely apart from the mainstream of settler colonial history. The one emphasizes people dealing with one another. The other has them stealing from one another. The one features fortunate amalgamations. The other forced assimilations. The one glimpses better times. The other exposes trails of bitter tears. Yet the currents of current scholarship and of mainstream history do not divide so cleanly from this alternative history, where alternate histories push into parallel dimensions. And only those of a certain age, maybe, <laughs> are actually appreciating this point here. While others push into a twilight zone, my alternative history does not exist in a separate plane, a separate plane of existence. It runs alongside the mainstream, revealing, I think, a contiguous face of the American frontier. It may, indeed, it, it may be useful, and I, I actually thought of retitling my book at one point to sort of clear up the confusion, but then I said, nah. Um, to be useful to see the alternative history that I present as an adjacent history of the American frontier. Not then in worlds apart, histories of concord and conflict should instead be seen as playing out along a spectrum alongside one another, at different uh, moments on the same timeline, often quite proximate. We find examples of relations moving back and forth from one end of the spectrum to the other, of people trading with former foes in one moment and then raiding them in the next, of convergences coalesced and, convergence, and conversions coerced, of peace between empires, nations, families, and communities brokered and then broke in. The shift meant that the common ground found was also lost. Accordingly, in the case studies that make up the alternative history's table of contents, accommodations were tenuous. Peaceful coexistences were temporary. Concord could be heralded, but it rarely held. Now, this recognition, finally, uh, distinguishes, again, mine alternative history from a sub-genre that I labeled wishtory, or the history we wish for. Um, wishtory, as I tell it, as I see it, tells stories about the past, but fictionalizes them in, way to, in ways that cater to contemporary yearnings. As with other alternate histories, wishtory, wishtories are untethered from what actually happened. Now, not that long ago, Western wishtories tended to come in the form or that Westerns took uh, in the sort of John Wayne um, sort of as the exemplification of that sort of, of an of a older version of a wishtory, of violence enabling the triumph of civilization. Um, I used to actually, I was saying this earlier today, I used to tell my students um, that to, to sort of explain the, ch the transformation and how Western scholarship and Western popular culture had shifted. It was the shift from John Wayne's Western to Dances with Wolves, until I realized that none of my students knew who John Wayne was, and they didn't even know who Dances with Wolves was, which made me feel very old. These older Westerns, though, I think we now understand war wisteries. Their plots and morality plays erased or forgave the messier ethnic and racial strife that shaped the history of the American frontier in the century after the American Revolution, or even more specifically in the case of most Westerns, in the decades after the American Civil War. Only in more recent decades have Western histories written in what Westerns wrote out. Yet our wisteries have shifted too. And this point was brought home to me, I should say, um, when I started quizzing my students 30 years ago, when I started teaching at Princeton, um, I would ask my students, um, you know, name the first Indian figures that come to your mind. And almost always it was sort of Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, Geronimo, Tecumseh. Um, by contrast, in more recent decades, and in some ways Disney's Pocahontas was emblematic in the shift, um, the, 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 the two American Indian figures that first emerged were Pocahontas 
and Sacagawea, you know, which is sort of a fascinating shift in terms of what it tells us, not so much about American Indian history or frontiers, but about ourselves and about, I would argue, about our own wisteries, um, that our own yearning for frontier origin stories that put us on a sort of, that showcase a kinder, gentler frontier origin story for us to fasten on to. Um, in any case, um, wisteries in general, older and newer, in the case of the Western, tend to sort of at least give the pretense of happily ever after endings. And again, the alternative history of what actually happened, whether it was Pocahontas or Sacagawea or any of the stories that I tell in more depth in the book, um, seem to me sort of, again, betray the idea of the once upon a time leading to the happily ever after. Um, that these are uh, sort of harder stories. Nonetheless, even though, as I say, I draw a distinction between wishtory and my alternative history, I, I do think that um, wishtory is important because it's important to think about the ways in which the sites and stories that I focus on and others have been remembered or misremembered or forgotten or turned into uh, some kind of fantasies for our, ourselves. So that uh, is also part of it. And they tell us a lot, I would argue, about our shifting hopes and dreams. Nonetheless, and here I'll sort of move quickly here, the episodes featured in my book um, do not unseat the mainstream Western history built on conflict and conquest. Nor, as I said, do they sit apart from it. Conquest and colonialism shape the history of the sites uh, that I focus on, as they did the rest of the, what is the West of the United States. Uh, but, I argue, in these places, for a time, geopolitical and intercultural currents constrained the exclusive occupation of these places by Americans under the uncontested rule of the United States. As I said, for varying durations, some better remembered, some mostly misremembered, and some almost entirely erased, those alternative relations presented an adjacent face of the American frontier. I don't have time to run through and summarize, you have to read the book for that, um, the lessons from each chapter, but let me try to lay out a couple of larger themes and key points, at least to um, bring these forward and to emphasize the centrality of Missouri in this story, in this alternative history. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, one lesson is to upend the oft-repeated claim that violence was vanquished when the forces of law and order, as represented by states, nations, and empires, gained sway over frontiers. Maybe in the long run, that was true. But more immediately in several of my cases, the intervention of powerful and well-armed agents of state order undid local arrangements and local limitations that had curbed excess violence. At least initially, the entrance of armies or even just the armaments provided by empires and nations enabled warfare on a much grander scale and turned frontiers much darker and much bloodier. Conventional wisdom today also, as reflected, and this came up in something earlier today I heard, conventional wisdom today reflected in the agendas of truth and reconciliation commissions, tends to hold that to reset relations, an essential first step is to uncover and acknowledge historic wrongs. Only when crimes against humanity are properly recorded and remembered can peoples and nations get past them and move towards rapprochement. But the, in chapters one and two, uh, which brings the alternative history into Missouri, I find opposite wisdom in the words and deeds of Daniel Boone. As Boone told his Shawnee captors at Chillicothe, forget what happened, quote, when he was a captive there in 1778, quote, many things happen in war that were best forgotten in peace. What peace there was around Chillicothe, around the Ohio Valley during and immediately after the revolution, and what peace there was between Shawnees and Americans in this part of the Mississippi Valley in the 1790s and into the first decade of the 19th century, I would argue, rested not on any remembering, not on any truth and reconciliation process, of lost lives or reckoning for lost lands, 
but instead on the pe people's ability to follow Daniel Boone's dictum to forget what happened in war. Now, Daniel Boone, as this, Charles, this is actually Ranny's version of, uh, most people know the George Caleb Bingham version of this same scene of Boone leading the, this is William Ranny's version of the same, which I think is a more interesting painting, but I will skip that for now. Um, uh, this is Ra uh, Boone leading the settlers through um, Cumberland Gap. Uh, version and here, you know, this is a much wish-storicized wish um, scene, um, and you know, I sort of use it to sort of highlight the fact how much Daniel Boone had to forget, um, in the sense of, you know, uh, for him to live peacefully alongside Shawnees here in Missouri, in particular. Um, remember that not long after the scene depicted here by by Ranny, uh, Boone's son James was killed. This is in 1773. Uh, the sight of James's mutilated body could not have been easily forgotten or forgiven. Yet even after a second of his sons was killed in, by Indians in 1782, Boone never succumbed to the blinding hatred of Native Americans that scorched the minds of many of his compatriots. Indeed, for most of his years in Missouri, he lived alongside some of the same Shawnees with whom he had been at war in the Ohio Valley in the 1770s and 18, 1780s. This is another of my favorite wishtery scenes of Boone living in isolation um, at Osage Lake, uh, Thomas Cole's painting of, of that scene. Again, I think that too, um, that wishtery of Boone, I think also mistakes the life that he lived here in terms of his uh, frequent interchange and living alongside uh, some of those same Shawnees with who had held him captive uh, uh, half a generation before. Um, I guess, you know, at this point we could ask, well, what explains Daniel Boone's exceptional qualities? Um, although he had long since stopped attending meetings of the Society of Friends, perhaps his Quaker upbringing imbued him with a more pardoning and pacific disposition. Or maybe after experiencing the brutality, the horrors of frontier war close up, he recoiled against them. For whatever reason, Boone was able to forgive and forget what happened in war, which enabled him to live in peace with some of the same Shawnees with whom he had battled on Kentucky's dark and bloody ground. Now, all this would be the stuff for biography and not history, except for the fact that this is a theme that I did explore in American Confluence, and I push further here uh, in Peace and Friendship, except for the fact that large numbers of Americans and Shawnees and Delaware Indians sought refuge in Spanish Louisiana in the 1790s and lived peaceably and friendshiply, friendshiply? No. Lived in peace and friendship alongside one another um, for a significant period of time. Uh, so it's not simply a biography, it is actually a larger history. Now, I would say before we dismantle our truth and reconciliation apparatus, we should remember that peace and friendship required more than letting bygones be bygones. For recent enemies to live serenely alongside one another as they did around Apple Creek in southeastern Missouri and other parts of what is now eastern Missouri in the 1790s into the 1800s, first decade of the 1800s, a host of other factors had to fall into place. And this is one of the larger themes I trace out. Th those factors would include the presence of a shared enemy. That's often crucial in these situations, a role that the Osage played in the case of the Shawnees and Americans in Missouri. Add to this the weakness of the colonial regime. Uh, it's not the strength of the colonial regime that brings peace and friendship or law and order. It's the weakness that I would argue keeps the peace from being disturbed. Mix in the limited and balanced numbers between Shawnees and Americans in the, into the early 1800s. Put these factors together and you have, a, a, and you have a, a formula for old enemies finding common ground. Take them away as happened here after the War of 1812 and those kind of intercultural friendships faded pretty quickly. Sandwiched between the chapters in the, um, in the book about the fall, rise and fall of peace and friendship here in Missouri is one on the Lewis and Clark ex expedition, beginning with their experiences in Missouri and then focusing in particular on Fort Clatsop, the western terminus of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And I focused on that 
place, not because I think actually it offered the best example of peace and friendship between the members of the Corps of Discovery and Indian peoples, but again, rather because that's where the most exuberant wish stories about the expedition were told during the bicentennial. Uh, the most famous incidents being um, the decision of where to locate the fort, uh, uh, whether it would be on the so south bank or north bank of the Columbia River um, for their winter fort in, in 1805, 1806. And the fact that they allowed York, Clark's African-American slave, and Sacagawea, the Indian wife of Charbonneau, um, to have a vote has launched a thousand historical uh, dreams in the bicentennial commemoration in particular. You know, this was the, and I remember in the Ken Burns film of the, the documentary that he did, I think it's Dayton Duncan, teary-eyed, sort of seeing this as the glimpse of the great democratic possibilities. Now, closer examination of what actually happened during the winter at Fort Clatsop really demolishes some of those sort of um, kumbaya stories that we tell about the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Nonetheless, I think there are lessons about how, even though Lewis and Clark were really, especially during the Fort Clatsop winter, not particularly good guests and terrible hosts, they did manage with the Clatsops around them to sort of do enough to keep the peace. And I go into some detail about how and why that worked and how it might have fallen apart even then. But you'll have to read the book to learn more about that one. Um, I then turn to the Oregon Trail, um, uh, and even, uh, and sort of again thinking about Missouri as the jumping off point, but looking in particular at Chimney Rock as the site along the Oregon Trail, convenient for me. Now, you know, again, the most familiar image that we have from generations of Westerns is of the circled wagon, the circled wagons, with Indians for no apparent reason riding around in circles around the circled wagons. Um, and obviously, a thousands of motion pictures have featured that scene, and it's become sort of the staple, even though, at least in the 1840s and into the early 1850s, we have almost no examples of scenes like this. Um, yeah, sometimes people circled their wagons in order to keep their livestock in so they wouldn't have to chase them around, but we have almost no examples of these kind of conflicts, at least through the 1840s uh, and into the early 1850s, really on the Overland Trail. Um, more recently, here again, I'll test my audience. And this one's for the younger folk in the room. Um, how many of you have played the Oregon Trail game? OK, look, that's a good number. What I actually did is I went back and looked at the original editions of the Oregon Trail game. Um, and um, in the original editions, Indians um, were in the first, I should say, in the first edition of the game, which dates to the early 1970s, Indians really played the menacing role that they were assigned in old-style westerns. Um, uh, they really were the great threat to the overland travelers on the Oregon Trail. By contrast, though, in newer versions, I sort of trace this history out, spotlighted, uh, I think quite rightly, the records of peaceful exchanges between emigrating Americans and Indians on the major overland thoroughfares um, in the 1840s. Uh, millions of players, let's see if you did learn this lesson, millions of players learned how Indians assisted overland travelers during the 1840s and 50s, and, and can assist them in the game's journey as well. So you don't all have to die of cholera. As with other sites and situations in this book, we can identify factors that built up and broke down alternative relations on the Overland Trail. From the start of migrations across the plains in the 1840s, tensions between Americans and Indians abounded. But as long as caravans were just passing through, as long as their numbers were limited, and as long as the United States military was mostly absent, Americans and Indians put aside their mistrusts to trade with one another. Stresses heightened, as did conflicts, after the discovery of gold in California, which multiplied the numbers of Americans on the trail and increased the presence of the United States military on the plains. The final breakdown of peaceful intercourse really awaited the aftermath of the Civil War, which is when Americans not only came in great numbers, and the railroad came, obviously, too, but Americans started to settle in significant numbers on the plains as well. Um, it's also when the United States unleashed its army and equally deadly its bureaucracy, both with lethal con consequences for Plains Indian peoples. 
The final chapter of my book is, I think, one that people find the most unexpected, and this is why I'm going to get a place in your, in your Santa Fe Trail um, uh, public project coming up. Um, Dodge City makes an unlikely culminating chapter to this alternative history. Its origins, too, trace back to Missouri, first via the Santa Fe Trail, and then the rail lines that turned the town briefly into the, cat, the queen of cow towns. During its heyday, Dodge City became notorious for its vice and violence. Its name stands in still for, for anarchic places with red-hot hatreds stained by the blood of too many dead. How many of you have played the game Red Dead Redemption, by the way? I'm really pandering to the crowd here, but, uh, but I'll explain the connection to Dodge City later if you ask questions. Uh, in any case, closer and comparative perspective offers Dodge City a measure of redemption. Racial animosities, at least as directed at African Americans, were far less pronounced in Dodge City and on the cattle tribes to it than they were in other parts of the American West, or for that matter, across the United States. In Dodge and on the trail, blacks lived better and black lives mattered more than in the southern states from which most cowboys hailed. In most of the years that Dodge City reigned as a count out, it was also far less deadly than several other places in the post-Civil War American West, including ones with similar demographic profiles. How was that possible? Not least because, not evenly, but um, that Dodge City did disarm people, and they also sort of paid police off not to kill people. Um, that is, the, the, the police were incentivized to, uh, to to sort of knock people out rather than shoot them because you only got paid by, you got paid by arresting people, not by killing them. Uh, I'm not sure these lessons are one that we all take away. Um, and to be fair, Dodge City doesn't offer a perfect laboratory, nor does history in general. In fact, alas, and I'll conclude here, that's the case for the instructions from across um, my table of contents, from across my alternative history. Much as we might wish, for a, histor to, for a historical how-to guide for how we can overcome our differences, the past is not so prescriptive. Lacking the freedom of alternate history, we can't swap out one fact for another or switch off one factor. Nor can we wave a wand to will different outcomes or isolate one true cause. The episodes chronicled and dissected in Peace and Friendship don't yield lessons that can be readily applied anywhere and any time. There is much we can learn from examples of unstable common ground, but the directions from my alternative history can be controversial, contradictory, and contingent. Nowhere in my alternative history can we find a record of continuous unbroken concord. Even as foes could forget, or at least put aside past enmities, differences were not permanently overcome. The legacy of broken concord on American frontiers from the Ohio Valley to the Pacific Coast and through the first century of the history of the United States underscores instead how ephemeral were understandings between peoples and across cultures. No doubt the collapses frustrate those of us seeking a sure, straight path to lasting harmony. Seeing the demise of alternate, alternative relations, though, only as dead ends is, in my view, too dark a view. From this alternative history, we should not shortchange the existence and, in some cases, the persistence of hospitable and inclusive cohabitations even if those did give way. So too we should remember the imperfect arrangements that forestalled violence for a while. Commemorating compromises that were compromised means accepting a legacy of concord that is not all we might wish for. But better a history of broken concord than a history of no concord. And better to continue to seek out places and periods where people once, and not just once upon a time, overcame differences. 
These are lessons that seem especially important now. Today, we are frequently told that the United States is on the verge of a new civil war, dividing not north and south or east and west, but red and blue. Our differences are framed as irreconcilable and existential. So too, it might have seemed to Daniel Boone and fellow Americans and Shawnees when they first came to Missouri, but they showed us that that need not be the case. Let us take hope in that, for there lies our path to peace and friendship. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you take questions? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, are there questions? Uh, Professor Aaron has agreed to try to answer some of your questions. Anyone? Yes. So I think that's actually a subject that is deserving of a book in itself. Um, and actually, some have written that book. I think, um, in some ways, Nicole Eustace's book that just won the Pulitzer, I think it won the Pulitzer Prize or Bancroft Prize, one of those, it sort of takes on that topic. Alan Taylor's written about it. That is, in some cases, it's a question of whose law and whose justice gets to prevail. That is often what is precisely at issue in these kind of frontier contexts. That in those cases where you know, American courts, for example, are sort of in charge and are able to enforce their law, a certain kind of justice tends to prevail. There are alternative justice systems in place, especially among various Indian peoples, tied often to traditions of covering the dead, of, of various other kinds of, of remuneration, uh, as opposed to, you know, uh, punishing the, uh, you know, bodily punishment or, or capital punishment of, of offenders. There are all sorts of alternative schemes. And I think oftentimes it's precisely the question of which justice system is, is allowed to prevail that is often determining both the character of pieces of peace and friendship, but also the balance of power in frontier relations. The larger point that I was trying to make, though, in, in this talk, and that I do sort of talk about in the book at some length, is I think we have a a notion from Westerns, though, that it is, you know, when, when the sheriff, or white, when the white-hatted sheriff arrives and puts down, whether it's, you know, uh, bad, you know, uh, lawlessness, or whether it's the cavalry coming in and slaying the Indians, in one way or another, it is the forces of law and order that are seen as bringing peace and friendship. And I guess I'm really trying to counter that view, that uh, at least in these frontier situations, um, where the contests of power are very much still at stake. Um, that's not how it works. And indeed, as I said, I think there are oftentimes local arrangements that you know, are hardly peaceful or hardly friendly, but there is violence is kept and contained in part simply by the resources people have or don't have to fight one another, and the necessity, in some ways, because of the lack of resources, to find some ways of curbing violence, containing violence, restraining it, keeping it in check. But when armies arrive, when well-equipped armies arrive, they, are, they ratchet up the level of violence that's possible. And I think, in that sense, I'm trying to, and I'm not sure what the full implications of this argument actually are from a present-day standpoint, um, but they certainly are disruptive of those local arrangements in ways that tend to escalate considerably the bloodiness and body count that you see in frontier warfare. So. It's partially answer to your question. I, I, I think though now if you're looking for the, the common way to apply it today, it's almost like the, 
you know, if you're in control, then your belief is right. So, and we see the weaponization of the law at the most fundamental level. So maybe it's something to that. I, I should say a couple of things here about um, what the book is and what it isn't. Um, you know, one, I, um, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm wary about trying to sort of make sort of general lessons that can be applied anywhere at any time. Part of the inspiration for the book was when I was chair of the UCLA History Department, I, this is sort of akin to the kindred suit, I secured a major gift to create a center for history and policy. Uh, and the donor was really quite interested in seeing the ways in which history could be prescriptive, that the lessons of history could um, uh, sort of be turned in these directions. And I'm not sure the book that I've ultimately written sort of does that, because as I said, I think the lessons tend to sort of not be always that clear cut, and sometimes contradictory and contingent, con you know, controversial too. Um, the other thing I should say, I should admit, is when I started this book, um, it was actually going to go, it was going to go to the present. Um, and I still have sort of various research and chapters on various chapters that were going to take the story from the 1880s, 1890s to the present and as various places and sites I was looking at for similar stories in the 20th century. When I decided to take the position at the Autry, I realized that my time to write said book was not going to exist. As I hope Gary can appreciate here, uh, that when you are when you take on these kind of roles, suddenly that time for research and writing um, disappears. And so there is a volume two, perhaps, but it awaits my retirement from yeah, which I hope you can appreciate. Can you speak to some of the irony of the forces of the United States being uh, the cavalry and the demographics of the cavalry in the West? The irony? Yes. Well, yeah, so I mean, again, I, I make the point, less, I do talk a little bit about the Buffalo Soldiers, and I certainly talk about them in the VSI, and um, I'm more interested in, in the African American cowboys in particular as an understudy, and I should say, in. 2025, when you all show up in Los Angeles, as I know you're going to do, we will have an exhibition on African-American cowboys, as well as on contemporary African-American equestrianism. In, so we are actually doing what I said about taking the frontier and historic story and connecting it to things like the Compton Cowboys and to other things sort of, you know, that are ongoing and continuous. So uh, there, but again, I think the cowboy story, like the Buffalo Soldier story, is one of relative betterment. And I think that's really crucial to sort of um, to focus on, relative. All things are relative here. And when I said black lives mattered more in Dodge City, I'm hardly sort of suggesting that Dodge City was some racial utopia. <laughs> it certainly was not. But I would argue that certainly if you were an African-American cowboy coming into Dodge City where the hotels and bars, at least for a significant amount of time, were not segregated, that is a pretty remarkable difference from most other places. And again, not to um, romanticize life on the trail for cowboys, um, you know, again, where there was some pretty significant rigid stratification in terms of what opportunities were available to non-Anglo cowboys. And let's to be candid, what opportunities there were for cowboys who often, who after all, almost never became cattle men. Um, and that distinction is a pretty crucial one. In any case, I would argue that opportunity for African Americans, who made up, again, depending upon what your, made up between one eighth and one quarter, probably, of the cowboy workforce um, in the heyday of the, of the cattle trails from Texas to Kansas in the 18, uh, late 1860s, 1870s, into the early 1880s, I would argue that opportunities still were, were better and relative possibilities were better than what existed elsewhere in the West, and certainly elsewhere in the Eastern United States. So that would be, I'm not sure that's irony, um, but it's certainly interesting history. Any other questions? So I have a question about history and policy. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking, I think most especially about the last example from Dodge City, and thinking about um, gun control, quite frankly. I've had a, a, a lot of opportunity to spend time with Saul Cornell, um, a famous historian of, of um, gun culture uh, in, in early America. 
and the kind of durability of mysteries around the West and I'm thinking also, I think about the kind of generational wisheries that exist. So one of one of Saul's, you know, great observations is that the Supreme Court takes more from you know bonanza than it does from the actual history that can be found um, in terms of sort of gun regulation. And I guess I'm sort of curious whether or not we're bound eventually for a different jurisprudence because there's a different wishtery on the horizon, you know, the, yeah. like the, the generation of the Oregon Trail, of which I consider myself a part, will eventually take the place of people who grew up on, 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 on Bonanza right. and, and the kind of, you know, cowboys and Indians shoot up of, of, the, of the 50s, 60s, 70s, right. and so forth. And, and I guess also to maybe throw in yet another, yet another kind of question, Historian's ability to, to, to pierce in particular, I think, wisheries about the American West that seem, in my mind at least, maybe even more durable than other than other wisheries that I that I can think. I like that my term is now in general play. <laughs> I, I do have to confess, I took enormous pride in coining that phrase, and I really was very, I said, wow, this is my ticket. If not to fortune, then to some degree of fame. Even though I have to say, when you refer to a historian as famous, um, I, I sort of, living in Los Angeles, we know what fame is. <laughs> and no academic is famous. <laughs> in any case, um, I think, um, and there are many, many parts of your question, so let me just tackle a few of them. So, no, and they're, they're actually wonderful questions. First, I'm not sure I'm as sanguine that the Oregon Trail generation, as you put it, has not now yielded to the Red Dead Redemption generation. And as near as I can tell, and I've only really played the game once or twice, Red Dead Redemption seems to celebrate not violence in the service of some noble cause, it seems to really celebrate nihilistic violence that as near as I can tell most people seem to one way or another just engage in orgies of meaningless bloodshed and as near as I can tell that's what the game seems to be about now I, clearly I'm not very skilled at it but so whatever feel good you know I used to sort of say that um, um, you know whatever feel good stories the Oregon Trail computer game might have been telling uh, Red Dead Redemption which is after all the most popular game there is, uh, you know, uh, uh, seems to sort of undermine that and go back to a sort of, but, uh, but, a, but not a nobling violence, it's more just celebrating its, I don't, know, I don't even know how to describe it, you know, I mean, it's, it, and in that sense, but that sign I showed from Dodge City, that was in the center of town, that was not some hidden, you know, sign, that, they were there and, and you know, the, the frontier, you know, they, did, they enforced it unevenly, um, in terms of the carrying of firearms being prohibited. They were much more effective uh, north of the line or that, rather than quote, south of the, what they called the dead line. Um, and really, on the, literally on the wrong side of the tracks, they really didn't. Uh, they were not nearly as effective. But the homicide rates in Dodge City were much, much lower than in many other places that we think of as, you know, as be, we think of Dodge City as being, it has become, you know, when you think about it, the, in myth and metaphor, Dodge City really stands in for the most lawless, violent places, and it really wasn't. And part of it was with the carrying of firearms being simply prohibited that, it, you know, look, I think most sociologists, historical sociologists are pretty quick to point out that, you know, if you get, you know, the, the cocktail, the lethal cocktail is um, young, transient, overwhelmingly male populations, often inebriated, and with firearms is the lethal cocktail. <laughs> you know, uh, so if you took one element out of that, the firearm, look, if, when you read the Dodge City records, they are filled with drunken disorderliness um, and people fighting, bite, biting. There's a lot of ear biting. People love to bite their ears off in the 19th century. I'm not quite sure why, but there's a lot of that. Um, but there's not the same lethality uh, in part because there is, you know, some element of gun control, as I said. Um, and does that, you know, as you say, that is something that needs to be, I think, introduced in. What I find fascinating, and again, you're the, you're the expert on this matter, so what I find fascinating, Anne, is that um, no one in any of those Dodge City cases where cowboys get disarmed 
I find no record of anyone ever invoking Second Amendment rights. <laughs> There's nobody saying that they have the right to open carry or conceal carry or whatever on the basis of a Second Amendment claim. That is obviously a trail that is much later and that is then wish door sized into a sort of 19th century setting in ways that was not the case, at least as near as I can tell. So. The narrative that you're unfolding, where you are based in the Autry Center, compared to the town of Gene Autry, Oklahoma, where the Gene Autry Museum is, which is dramatized, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Hollywood history. <laughs> well, I like to think <laughs> that when Gene and Jackie Autry founded the museum, their goal was to tell the real history of the American West um, alongside and entwined with the mythic history of the American West. And I like to think that what I've been talking about for the last 45 minutes or so fulfills their vision. Thank you for your talk. Um, how did you cope with the perennial problem of having, doing justice to the voices of the indigenous people? And also the problem of stratification of different tribes and their perception of the right settlement of, of everything. So how did you cope with this? I know it's very tricky and very complicated. Well, you know, again, in the VSI, one had 35,000 words. And, you know, I had some more here. But yeah, look, I recognize that the complexity of Native American histories, cultures, and frontier exchanges is one that is hard to, you know, to still. Look, um, again, I'm going to give sh shameless plug to the Autry Museum. We hold, um, next to the Smithsonian, the second largest collections of Native American uh, materials uh, of Native American history. So, you know, obviously we are particularly interested in telling those stories and we are committed, this is off track on this topic of my own book, but we are committed to, we have a native collection policy that mandates that we will, we will only tell the stories, we will only exhibit, loan, um, uh, open to researchers with the collaboration with contemporary tribes. So that is a sort of, you know, if museums historically, and this is maybe a subject you can have me back for another talk here, I'd be delighted to come. If historically the relationship between mu museums and indigenous peoples was, you know, sort of museums here and native peoples or indigenous peoples around the globe, we can talk about German museums in this context too, because I've just been reading some on that, um, you know, here, or actually not even here, here. You know, <laughs> you know, in this thing. I think we, at the Autry and other museums are trying to move towards more here. You know, that is sort of, you know, some sort of more equal relationship. So that's not an answer to your question about how are we, how does my book deal with it, or how do I deal with my teaching? But it is an answer to, I think, institutionally, how the museum I lead is trying to lead the way in terms of rethinking the relationships between museums and the collections we steward or the collections, I would say, that we co-steward, um, and the native communities from, uh, from which these ancestral creations emanated. Not really an answer to your question, but I think a larger and a crucial philosophical point. Uh, before I get to my question, I do want to throw up a slight but then spread that for Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say a lot of violence in that game. Yes. You know, if, you, if you murder so much, you actually get the bad ending and play the game. That's just me. Okay, but um, I guess everyone I played with always got so frustrated that they just ended up killing everyone they could and then getting killed. Yeah, that's fair. I wanted to ask also, um, um, also ask about the idea of wish stories. I really liked how you, you know, kind of phrased it. Oh, wait, let me just finish that point because I was, sorry, I got, you had a lot of questions. So I, I barely tackled any of them yet. But wish story, I was so proud of myself for coining that phrase. And then I discovered that Sears, <laughs> I used it in an advertisement oh. in like 2009. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I was just so deflated. But, but actually, the advertisement starred, um, I think it was 
like Vanessa Hudgens, who was like a Disney star. And I felt like there was at least some justice in that, because Disney is probably the largest purveyor of wish dreams of, of, any, uh, you know, of any popular cultural entity. So I guess it fit in some roundabout scheme. Back to wish dreams. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Um, I was, you know, you talked about how you know, sometimes wish dreams are not so much necessarily like intentionally getting the details wrong, but more just a reflection of art. The people, the person who's telling the witch to read their own reflections of what's right. happening in the, in the world they currently inhabit. Um, this might be an example to the outside of your house and one of the other side of the world, technically. There's been a lot of controversy in the last kind of week or so of a Netflix show uh, making a decision to cast to keep Cleopatra as black. And I know my colleague Jeffrey Stevens probably has a lot more, to, uh, has a lot of things to talk about with that. But, um, a lot of ideas. But, um, you know, the production team will make the argument that this is you know, combating an earlier wish story of Liz Taylor, kind of Cleopatra, that dominates a lot of the right. culture. There's the other side that would argue probably we're facing one wish story with another. Um, so what I don't, what do you make of, of that recent controversy when you consider you kind of dealt so much into this on the American side? Well, I mean, again, the ones that I've, I mean, I'm, because again, I don't by any means suggest that this kind of tendency towards wishery is somehow unique to the United States or to, you know, I mean, so the fact that in other places there are similar currents that reframe historical sagas to sort of, in one way or another, kind of both more accurately capture certain demographic and historical realities, but also to better speak to contemporary yearnings comes as no surprise to me. I don't think, I think again, if we went around the room, um, people could think of all sorts of other recent examples that fit this profile of the ways in which, and as I said, what to me is fascinating about wishtories, get ready for another shameless plug for the Autry Museum. <laughs> as we will tell in a gallery opening this June, imagined Wests, plural, um, you know, is the way in which they reflect our shifting hopes and dreams that we fasten onto. Um, and the fact that, for example, we had a former gallery that was once basically a history of the Western genre, as Gene Autry might have known it, uh, that has now morphed into a new gallery that is much more pluralistic, diverse, imagines pe the West from lots of different points of view, allows Indian peoples and non-Anglo peoples sort of to their full telling, is again, I suppose, also, you know, like wish these aren't bad, necessarily, I think, but we just need to recognize them for what they are, too, I think. Um, and not mistake them for, you know, somehow getting history right. We're kind of stuck with the term West. Oof. <laughs> so, look, I mean, you're stuck with it. I'm running a museum. I'm running a museum with the title Autry Museum of the American West. You didn't hear me say that. You did not hear me say that. Turn that camera off. <laughs> um, but also, in a city, I was talking about this about when I would, I talked about this in the teaching demonstration when we were talking about teaching. You know, for me, I, my students at UCLA, when I would ask them, do you think of yourselves as Westerners? Or where is the American, what is the American West? What is it to know? Where is the American West? None of them thought they were Westerners. You know. They live in Los Angeles. That's the Westest West. <laughs> That's where the West was invented, at least from a certain vantage point. Um, it's where I would argue that the West, the things that make the West the West, play out only more so. That what happens in Los Angeles doesn't stay in Los Angeles. It prefigures what happens elsewhere in the West. But none of them think that or believe that which is a profound challenge for someone running a history of the, uh, uh, a museum about the history of the American West in a place where most of my prospective visitors no longer have that kind of resonance that an older generation did, and 
where even the founder's name is not particularly meaningful. So would you like to take my job? <laughs> we have time for maybe one more question. There you go. Uh, excellent talk, and I look forward to reading your book. I'm struck by the overall framing of your work regarding West and empire and conquest. It seems that what you're looking for and what you found in this alternative history of the West requires empire being weak and not thorough, and laws being less applicable uh, if they're coming from a national or centralized state or place, or if the border camp isn't so um, militarized and locked down. Does this have any resonance? I mean, the city you're at is the city of Swat, right? This immense militarized policing for the 21st century in ways that no other city quite could do. Does your story, as you see it, as you were hoping to write the part two, maybe as a teaser, promise some alternatives that get around this problem. <laughs> no, I mean, look, therein lies, you know, when, when you started, I was fully yes, yes, yes. You know, the weakness of empires, the weakness of nation states um, is often, you know, what keeps frontiers more left blood. That itself is a pretty controversial kind of statement that I expect to be fully, roundly, <laughs> I was going to say savagely, but that would be the wrong word here. Uh, critiqued for um, in you know in the in the academic literature, no question about that. That that will that's going to be roundly attacked. Um, but I'll stand by it. Um, where you went though, then taking it to the 21st century is you know where I'm. I'm not sure where we go because as I said, I, I sort of tried to hedge my bets a little bit. Maybe you didn't catch that little hedge um, uh, where I said you know. For, at least initially, the entrance of these forces disrupts existing arrangements and escalates the, the means of violence and the reality of violence. But I'm not sure where, as I say, as you force me to take the argument, um, then I get less sure where, where, where it goes and what the implications are. So I need to think about that. Because as I say, I haven't written volume two. But someone here can write it. Thank you very much.